Welcome back to the 13th Annual Florida Youth Summit presented by the Florida Youth Council. So we've come to our last session of the weekend. Um, once again, my name is Derek Carraway, and here with me is Alex Gonzalez. We hope you guys actually enjoyed these last two days and all the sessions that have been presented throughout, these, uh, throughout the weekend. And we all appreciate you guys actually being here and getting to spend your weekend with us no matter where you're at. I hope you guys all enjoy your sessions and make sure if you have any questions, you'll leave it in the comment section down below, at least for our guest speakers, so that way we can answer the questions right at the end of the session. So to present our final session of the uh, Youth Summit, we'd like to welcome back one of our guest speakers from yesterday, Lacey DeSherry, as she will be presenting, We Are Not Our Shame. So Lacey, without further ado, you have the floor. Thank you. I am so happy, so glad to be back. Um, I hope that you all have had a wonderful conference over the last couple of days and that you picked up a lot of really awesome messages and tidbits and lessons uh, for empowering yourself as we move forward through the rest of a really trying year. Um, I know that the more skills that we gain and the more connections that we have, um, the more healed we can become and the better we can deal with anything that comes our way. And so this today is a little bit more of a heavy topic um, and there will be some moments. So I just want to give a little bit of a content warning. There will be some moments where I'm going to talk about some pretty rough stuff um, that I've been through that I'm sure many of you all have been through as well. Um, and I want to do that in a way that's hopeful. And so this is um, you know, not a message of shame. This is a message of hope on how to overcome shame and uh, separate ourselves out from, from what that is and how we can move forward and leave it behind us, right? So, um, so I'm going to share a little bit about what shame is, um, share a story of my own experience. And then along with the theme that has been this whole week, I really want to tie it to the characters in Toy Story 4, um, and kind of illustrate the process that I've gone through and being able to separate myself from shame and kind of have a little bit of freedom from that. And so I want to illustrate the journey of a few of the characters through the movie as we talk about what that process looks like in moving forward from shame. So what is shame? Okay, when I talk about shame, what does that even mean? What am I talking about? So shame is an emotion. Right. And we all have it. Everybody. Um, it comes in different forms. It says different things to each of us. Uh, we may have picked it up along the way in different places from different people. Um, but what shame is, is the message that we get from inside of ourselves that I am bad. And I wanna separate this out a little bit from guilt, right? So Brene Brown uh, is a researcher. She's done a ton of work on shame and guilt and other emotions. Um, and so I wanna just separate that out. So shame is the voice inside of us that says, I am bad. And guilt is something, is the voice that says, oh, I did something really bad, right? So if we separate out, I am bad from I did something bad, I did something bad means that I can fix it. I can go and make amends, I can apologize, I can um, you know, make up for something. Whereas if I say that I am bad, I don't really have a place to go from there. And so shame really keeps us locked in to it, it, a really small space, it limits us. It doesn't give us a lot of hope or a lot of room to grow, right? And that's what shame does is it likes to keep us locked into the worst messages that we think about ourselves whether they're true or not. And so we're gonna talk a lot about that today. Shame says you're not enough. Uh, who do you think you are? Uh, anybody out there that has struggled with imposter syndrome who um, has these amazing accomplishments but still thinks, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, who am I to apply for this job? There's no way I can do it. Or you do the, these speaking engagements or you do these projects at school and like, oh my gosh, everybody's gonna find out that I'm a fraud, right? So. Those are messages from shame, okay? Shame thrives in secrecy. So we have a saying in recovery that we're only as sick as our secrets. And that's so true. When we can bring shame out into light, 
when we can speak it, when we can give it a name, then it dies. Okay, so there's a lot of shame that I think a lot of us experience around, particularly, you know, I talked yesterday a little bit about stigmas from being in foster care, from experiencing multiple types of abuse growing up. Um, there's a lot of shame in that um, that gets put on onto people who've experienced that, right? Like me. Um, and then we also can experience shame from different abilities uh, that we have. And so um, maybe we need other, um, you know, wheelchairs or crutches, or maybe I need to take medication to maintain my mental health. Um, you know, those are a lot of things that can allow shame to enter if we don't talk about it, if we don't embrace it, if we don't find those connections with other people that also experience the same thing, right? And so I want to talk a lot about that today. Shame is limiting. It limits our ability to grow. It limits our faith in ourselves. It limits our hope for a better future. It limits our sense of empowerment within ourselves. And it can keep us really small and hidden. And when we stay small and hidden, we are not able to help other people, right? We are not showing our light. We are not showing our strengths and helping other people when we stay hidden and silent and in shame. But there is a solution to shame and that is empathy. So when we can speak shame out loud, it starts to, to lessen its power over us. And when we have empathy, whether that's from other people or whether that's for ourselves, then shame dies. Okay, so when we are able to connect with emotions, when we're able to have compassion for ourselves and care for ourselves and care for other people in a way that's non judgmental, that builds trust, that has appropriate boundaries, then we can actually break free from shame. And so I want to share a little story about my experience um, with shame. And now I am somebody who experienced sexual abuse growing up. And I'm not gonna talk about details, but I will say that there was a certain uh, thing that happened that made me really internalize a specific message about myself when that happened when I was 12 years old. And that message was that I am a piece of trash. I am worthless. I am no good to anybody, and I might as well not even be alive. And so I, I encourage you, if that message is really hard to hear, make sure that you're reaching out for support. Um, but that was the message that I carried with myself since I was 12 years old. I didn't know that I was carrying that message. I didn't know that that message was what drove me to overachieve, to become addicted to work, to use alcohol to cover up the pain that I had. Um, I would, you know, mess up contracts because I thought, well, I'm no good anyway. So why am I even bothering with this? Um, you know, I would get C's in class because I knew that I was really good at the tests, but I was like, well, you know, when I came to writing papers, I was like, I didn't have anything important to say. So I just wouldn't write anything or I'd be stuck and I couldn't get any of my voice out, right? And so I carried this message that I am a piece of trash, I am worthless, and overcompensated for that for a really long time. And it cost me a lot in my mental health. It cost me a lot. And so it cost me in relationships. Um, it cost me in my ability to show up for other people. And it cost me in a relationship with myself, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well. And so it wasn't until this past summer that I really understood how much of my life that that particular message had taken over in my, my whole life, right? Every single thing I did, it was like this message in the back of me that was a filter that every other thought, every other action came through, right? I'm a piece of trash, therefore I had to do all these other things and it was all driven by that one message. So this summer, um, I want to share a little bit about, I went to this, um, I went to this therapy retreat and it was six days, super intensive, eight hours of group therapy every single day. And it was by far one of the most amazing things I have ever gotten to do in my life. 
And so if anybody out there is struggling or not sure that they can say certain things out loud, I would absolutely encourage looking into finding some kind of a support that works for you. Um, but at this therapy place, and we, um, we called it love camp, um, <laughs> Cause it was, it was about healthy relationships. And I really went looking for how do I find how to be, how to have a re healthy relationship with myself. And so we participated in this activity that was, um, that was called ABC, right? So it's talking about relationships and the drama triangle. Um, so this is some work from a therapist and a, a counseling psychologist um, called Cartman's triangle. And it talks about um, it's the ABC triangle, right? So there's the victim role that we can play with ourselves or in a relationship. There's the rescuer role that we can play. And then there is the perpetrator role, right? And so if I'm playing this out in myself, it looks like, oh, I, um, I'm not good enough, right? The victim role is that I'm not good enough. I can't do anything right. Um, I'm just, I'm so worthless. Why did I even try to attempt, you know, getting an A in this class, I'm never going to be able to do this. And then the rescuer comes in into my own brain and says, um, oh, I know you feel bad. I know what will make you feel better. And that's where numbing behaviors come in. That's where avoidance behaviors come in. So maybe I go and eat a whole bunch of ice cream because that's going to make me feel better. Um, used to it might have been alcohol or other um, substances, right? So it's different for everybody, but that's what we'll do whatever it takes to make us feel better, whether it's healthy for us or not. Okay. Then we get into the persecutor role. And that's where the messages that we tell ourselves, and I don't know if anybody else listening has ever done this to themselves, but that's where I get into the role of, oh, I'm so stupid. How could I do that? Why did I overschedule myself? I'm never going to be able to do this. Like, you're so stupid. And I get into those messages, right? And so when I was at the, the camp and working through this with a therapist, um, the therapist was talking about, you know, where is that message coming from? That I'm so stupid, I'm not good enough, I'm never going to be good enough. Where is that message coming from? Where else have you heard that in your life? And I realized that that message actually came to me when I was a child, when that abuse happened to me. That's what, um, there was a certain thing that happened that made me carry that message. And in that moment, I realized that that message that I'm telling myself that I am worthless, that I am stupid, that I, I can't do anything, I can't be of service to anybody, that wasn't even my message. That wasn't even coming from me. That was coming from what had happened, right? From the person that that, that had happened with. And that was a huge moment for me, a huge moment of realization that I, I am not my shame. I am not my shame. I am not that message. And through some further therapy um, in, in talking that out and actually role-playing that out with other members in the group, I was able to realize that, wow, okay, that's, that's a message that you gave to me. That's a message that I don't have to keep. And that's a message I can give back, right? And so I cannot tell you how freeing it was to give that message back and to know that I don't have to live in that message anymore. Um, so I, I have this image of the hummingbird because this is what that represented to me. So hummingbirds um, are able to fly zigzag and up and down and all over the place. And by physics, they should not be allowed to do that, right? They defy all the odds. And so that's what that represented to me is that freedom of defying the odds of having been in foster care, having mental health diagnoses, having substance use challenges and being able to oh, rise above those, right? Not stay stuck and not be limited by those messages of shame. And so I want to talk a little bit more about what the process looks like. And so I had actually written that in a, a newsletter email that I had sent out to, um, to everyone on my listserv. And that's how uh, Lori Fahey, who is the executive director of the Family Cafe, shout out to Lori, um, she came across that message and, and was like, wow, that, that, that would be helpful. I want you to help um, our young people go through that process, right? So I'm not gonna be able to be one-on-one -on -one with you right now. I wish that I could. I wish that we could be in person and we could actually workshop this out together. 
Um, but what we can do and what you can do is follow along with me over the next 30 minutes or so, so that you can um, start working on this. And again, if you're not ready, you just wanna take notes, that's great. If you wanna try to work out a little bit of it, that's great too. Just make sure that you have the right healthy connections and the right supports in place. Um, I do recommend that, you know, this is a little bit deeper work. So if you do have a mental health professional, if you have a peer support person, if you have friends that have gone through this, um, definitely make sure that you engage with your support systems. But I wanna talk now a little bit about what does the process look like to connect with and overcome our shame so that we can be free, right? So that we're not driven by that voice all the time. So the first step is being able to name it. And this might be a little bit harder than it seems, right? So it's simple, but it might not be easy. Um, so I had those voices and I didn't realize that that was called shame. I didn't realize those voices when I would overschedule myself and say, you're so stupid. How could you have not done that? Like I didn't recognize that as shame. And so anytime that you have voices coming up in your head that are saying, you're not, insert something here, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not, you know, capable. Nobody wants to listen to you, right? Anytime you hear messages like that, that is shame. And so if you can write those down and, um, and we'll talk about some strategies about that, but the more that you can name it and give it a name and speak it out loud, the less power it's going to have over you. So I want to talk a little bit about this. So in Toy Story, one of our favorite characters, Forky, um, he really believes that he's trash, right? Why is that? Where did that message come from? Well, he was born out of trash, right? He was born in a certain environment. Um, he has all of his supplies and makings came out of the trash can, okay? And so this is when we talk about that messages of shame can come from our environment. And so when he was born or given life by Bonnie in the movie, um, he believed he was trash and he kept running back to the trash can, right? Because as he said, it felt warm and cozy and safe, okay? That was where he believed that he's trash. He didn't know that he was a toy. He didn't know that he had a larger purpose that he had to serve in being a friend and a support to Bonnie and helping her through things and helping other toys right, whenever they would come, um, come to life. And so he believed that he was trash and he did not wanna go anywhere but that because he didn't know yet, right? And so that can be a message of shame. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be, but um, you know, his belief that he's trash because of where he came from can be a message of shame, right? So shame can come from a few different places. It can come from society and the message that we get when we compare ourselves to whatever society says is, normal or acceptable or valued. Um, we can get those messages from people who have power over us or um, that we find that we really want that validation, right? So when we're children, our parents are so important and our older siblings are so important. And if we receive a message that is a shaming message from them, we internalize it as shame. Not that, so if, if you know, somebody spills something, and the message from the parent is, you are a bad kid. That is a shame message. Whereas if somebody, if a kid spills something and say, oh, you messed up, you, you did something bad, you spilled it, now let's clean it up. We don't internalize that as shame, right? Because we separate out that behavior from who we are. And so if we're given messages of shame growing up, we have to be able to recognize where it came from and whose voice it is that's giving us that message. So we, um, so that's the first step, right? And then the other, the other message can come from ourselves. So if we are doing that to ourselves, if we are comparing ourselves to social media, to other people that we see that, that we don't know their whole story, right? Um, that we think, well, we'd be better off if we were like these people or we had these characteristics like other people, then, um, you know, then, then that message can come from ourselves, okay? So we want to unpack that, be able to name what the shame is. That's the first step. You have to be able to name what it is and then understand where it comes from, okay? So like Forky said, it's warm, cozy, and safe. 
the trash can, right? So he was talking about trash as warm, cozy, and safe. And that is what he wanted to stay in because it was warm, cozy, and safe. And so when we grow up in an environment that is traumatizing or that is chaotic or that is abusive or that does emit messages of shame onto us, that is what we feel is normal, okay? That's what we are comfortable with. Even though it might not be safe or healthy, we get comfort in those things. And so that's why, um, you know, there's a lot of research out there and I'm not going to go into all of the details, but when we grow up and we start having, we play out the same roles that we had as a child, right? If those were unhealthy roles, then we start seeking out partners, seeking out friendships, seeking out work relationships that allow us to recreate that situation that we were in when we were a child. It's like, why do we keep doing that? Why do we keep wanting that chaos and that drama, even though it's super stressful? It's because of this concept right here, that what we grew up with felt warm and, and cozy, right? It was comfortable. That's what we knew. Um, and so until we get to a place where we can recognize that there's actually a better way to live, we're probably going to stay in that trash can for a really long time. Um, there is a way out. And when we, and, and we'll talk about that as the last step. And so we, it's not always safe. Uh, it doesn't feel safe all the time or cozy when we work on changing and healing ourselves. When we take that journey of healing and addressing our inner shame, addressing our inner wounds and being able to, um, to change the narrative about ourselves. It's not safe. It doesn't feel safe. It doesn't feel comfortable. It's going to feel really weird and wobbly, right? So, you know, how Forky kept wanting to run back to the trash can for like the first, I don't know, 40 minutes of the movie. That was that behavior that's like, okay, I, I need to go back to what I know, right? Even though there's such a better world out there and it's, it's, there's a, a place where we can be empowered and healthy and happy and in connection with other people, Sometimes we want to keep running back to what feels safe and normal, okay? So that's a little bit about shame and where it can come from and why it's so important to name what it is. Because when we name it, we can do something about it. So we also need to recognize where that comes from. Like I said, it can come from three primary places. It can come from society. It can come from people who are really important to us, or it can come from within ourselves if we're doing that to ourselves or comparing it to someone else. And so we need to understand where this voice comes from that's giving us that message of shame if we're going to be able to know what we need to do with it, right? And so if that shame message is coming from society, sometimes it means that we might have to relook at ourselves and how we're, you know, how do we value the messages that society is giving? Are they important to us? Um, or are they not important to us? Do I even agree with what society is saying is important, right? So we've got to be able to explore that and know the messages that are sent um, to us through media, through people, through social media, right? Um, is it from a person of influence or power? So like, for example, in my story, this was a person who had power over me as a child. And that message, once I realized, because I always thought that it was just within myself, I always thought that was that I was just a broken person, that I was never going to be able to be healed and whole, right? And so when I realized that moment, when I realized that that voice was not even my voice saying that, that wasn't even my shame, that wasn't mine to carry. And I was able to put that away, put that aside, give it back to the other person that actually it was their voice, right? That allowed me to walk free from that message. And so we've got to know who it's coming from. And if it's coming from within ourself, we've got to really step up our game on how do I need to love myself, right? How do I need to nurture myself and take care of myself and those needs that I need met um, that only I can meet um, so that, that that shame message isn't going to drive us like it did before. And so when Woody and Buzz are... Um, talking to each other, they talk about, you know, recognize that voice within. Um, and so that voice is inside of you. And it might be that it's being drowned out by, um, by these messages of shame, right? So I would encourage you to do an exercise. Um, you can write this down, or you can put some in the comments, right? So 
your, your message of shame, if, if that's what you're listening to and that's what you're hearing all the time, we've got to be able to balance that out with the true message within yourself, right? So Woody and Buzz in the movie talk a lot about that voice within. And we've got to be able to find that voice within that cares for us, that has positive things to say about us. And so if you write down the shame message, you can then write down the opposite, right? And then focus on what the opposite message is. So when I say my, my shame message would say, I'm a piece of trash, I'm no good to anybody. I can write down the opposite of that and say, I am worthy, I am valuable, and I'm important to other people in my life, okay? Then I can take that message and focus on that message because what we focus on grows. And so if we can counteract that shame message with a positive message, and focus more energy on that positive message, it's gonna grow and it's gonna be louder and it's gonna be stronger. And then we'll actually start believing it, okay? So it's so important to understand where the voice is coming from and what we can do about it and be able to switch that voice in our inner heads, right? Do I talk to myself like I talk to somebody I love? Would I say those things in my head that I say, you're so stupid, you're so, awful, you're a piece of trash. Would I say those things to anybody else in my life that I care about? No, I would not. And so we've got to be able to flip that script and say, okay, what is it that I would want to talk, tell myself? What would I want to tell my little girl that she's, that she's wonderful, that she has value, that she is a really good person? You know, the things that we should, that we want to say to those that we love the most, those are the things that we need to be making sure that we're saying to ourselves as well. So the next step, step three, is being able to separate that shame from ourself. And so we might do this in a few different ways. Um, you know, this might look like writing the shame messages on a piece of paper and um, tearing it up or giving it back to whoever gave us that message. Um, we can write a letter to shame and talk to shame and say, I know that you exist. I know that you have a function, but what you say isn't true. What you say is keeping me small. What you say is keeping me from feeling empowered and free. And what you say is keeping me from being of service to others. I don't have room for you anymore. I'm going to let you go now. Right? So we can write a letter like that to shame and you can write a letter to shame, whatever that is for you. Um, just let it, let it flow. And that can help separate you from shame. Um, you could do some experiential work with a therapist. Um, if you have a therapist, this might be something that you could ask them to, if you could do. Um, for me, in the scenario that I shared this summer, there was actually a blanket that I was able to have represent as that shame. And when I was able to name what that shame was as that blanket, and I was able to give that shame back, physically throw it back to the person that had put it on me, I felt free. I was able to separate that out from who I am, right? Remember at the beginning, we talked about shame versus guilt. Shame is I am bad. Guilt is I did something bad. And so even if we're feeling shame from something that we've done, the way out of that is to take accountability, to make amends, to put appropriate boundaries in place, and to, again, refocus on those positive messages about ourselves. And so that's exactly what Woody did for Forky when they went on this journey and they were talking about being trash, right? So, um, so Forky was talking about when he was trash and he believed that he's trash and he believed that that's where he needed to stay in that small enclosed, as he called it, warm, cozy trash can. And Woody helped him to understand that actually he served a larger purpose, that he was that warm, safe, cozy um, person for Bonnie, right? So he was what made her feel warm, safe, and cozy. And when he was able to see that he had a bigger purpose outside of himself, when he was able to move past that view that was very limiting, that he's trash, he's only trash, he needs to be in the trash can and stay there forever and be just used, as I think he said, what was it like, be used for a salad or maybe some chili and then be thrown back in the trash can? His belief was so small and limiting that that was, he was only there for one single purpose, one time use and be put back, right? And talking with somebody else who could see the strength in him, who could see the value that Forky had 
and see that Forky served a larger purpose and that was to help support Bonnie through her really scary transition into kindergarten, um, that is what we need. So if we are doing that for other people, that's great. We also need that for ourselves. And so it's so important to find those people who can reflect that good back to us. Um, there's also a saying that I love um, that if you spot it, you got it, right? So that's a saying that we have in recovery. If you spot it, you got it. And normally we mean that if something is bothering you and it's about somebody else, that means that you have that character defect as well. That means that if you're annoyed by somebody that talks, 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 then we need to reflect and be like, do I do that to other people? But it can also mean if you spot it, you got it, that those strengths and other people, that we have those strengths too. And so I'd love for you to comment right now. Think of your three best friends, your three most favorite people in this whole world that mean a lot to you, right? It could be family, it could be friends, it could be um, people that are inspirational. And I want you to type in the three strengths that you see in them. Type in the comments, what do you see that's positive in other people? So whether it's they're inspirational, they're beautiful, they're smart, they're funny, they're talented, whatever it is that you see in other people, type that into the comment box. Because there's a very famous psychologist who talked about what exists in others exists in ourselves. And so if we didn't have those attributes that we can see in other people, we wouldn't have those in ourselves, right? If we couldn't see those in other people, we don't have those. And so if you think somebody's talented, if you think they're smart, if you think they're funny, if you think they're beautiful, that means you have that in yourself as well, because we cannot see what we don't have. And so when you type those strengths and you look back at those strengths now, having typed those, that means that you have those two within yourself. Okay. So we can reflect the good in others. And we have to remember that if we reflect the good in others and help them to overcome their messages of shame, we also have that attribute within us. Sometimes it's hard to accept, especially if the, stronghold, if the shame stronghold is like, yeah, but I don't think I'm smart. I don't think I'm funny. But I promise you it's in there. It might just be that the shame messages are so loud you haven't been able to listen and hear the other strengths yet. So we can reflect the good in others and we can see that good reflected back to ourselves. So the fourth step to overcoming shame is to replace the old version with a newer, a truer version of ourselves. All right. So if we have these negative messages, if we're hearing that society is saying that you should stay small, your voice doesn't matter, um, that you're too different to belong, you're too different to be cool. Um, uh, you know, I, I always had that I'm worthless. I'm not worth it. And those messages are just so not true. They're not true. We have to be able to name them, understand where they come from in order to rewrite that story. And so when we can replace those messages with a truer version of ourself, uh, that's not limited, that's not small, that's not stuck behind these shadows of shame, then we are able to be more free. And so, I love how this plays out in this scene with Duke Kaboom. And, you know, when they're talking about how he's got to serve this purpose, he's got to make this huge jump um, so that they can save their friend, right? And he talks about this message of shame that was placed on him by the kid that he had um, whenever he was new, a new toy. And so Duke Kaboom is saying, you know, I can't make that jump. I can't jump as high as the commercial did. You know, again, that comparing himself to the commercial and how he was discarded, right? So like, that's how I felt. I was discarded. I was, you know, not worthy. Um, and he was discarded because he couldn't measure up to these unrealistic expectations that the, that the kid had for him in the movie, right? And so his friends are reflecting back to him the strength that he has. And no, he couldn't make the biggest jump and he couldn't land the jump, but he could crash it, right? And so he thought that he wasn't worthy because he could only crash, he couldn't land perfectly. And what his friends were saying is that, no, actually that's your strength, we need you to crash. Like that's the biggest strength that you have, like that's your value. And so he was able to flip that story 
because he had that good reflected back from his friends and say, oh, so I used to think I was really bad and worthless because I could only crash, but now I actually have value because I can crash, right? So it's really flipping that message, flipping that story of shame and seeing our strengths that we have in ourselves. Um, and that's ultimately finding that truer version of you. And so when we see ourselves differently, we can be differently, right? We can show up differently and we can bring value that we didn't realize that we had before. Um, it is scary to change. I want to acknowledge that. Um, you know, there's that, that circle of uh, over here that's comfort, right? That's comfortable that we stay the same. And sometimes it's comfortable, even if it's not a healthy circle to be in. If it's a shameful circle, if it's a, a traumatic circle, but we stay there because we feel like it's safe because it's not unknown, right? Because it's known. When we move out into the unknown and we start getting healthier and we start getting to know ourselves better and become a more true version of ourselves, it's uncomfortable. It's hard. It's scary because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to change. And that's, that's why it is so important to do that in context with you know, positive, healthy relationships and support, but we never know how good it is until we go through the pain, right? The answer to pain is through the pain. And so whenever this comfortable place gets painful enough, that's usually when people change. If we have that growth mindset we talked about yesterday and we're able to move forward because we want to be better, we want to serve a higher purpose. We realize that our shame messages were telling us things that were not true. We don't want to stay small and we don't want to stay in the same place. We want to grow. We want to be the best version of ourselves. We want to help other people, right? Then it's, that's when we go into change. And that is scary and it can be scary, but it is so worth it. When I, um, you know, I was really scared to go to that therapy retreat. I was really scared to show up differently. Um, and, and then when I did and I faced it and I turned and faced it and embraced the fear, embraced the, the messages of shame, that was the only way, you know, I, I stopped running from it and I started embracing it so that I could be better. I could heal. I could be a better mom, right? I could be a better friend. And so that's when I was able to make that shift and actually take steps forward to change. And through that process is how we're able to accept a greater purpose. Okay. So when we find that greater purpose, then um, through acceptance, then we're able to really live differently. We don't have to live in those messages of shame anymore. We don't have to live in that, um, that place that's scary and staying small you know, so for Duke Kaboom, he knew that like, wow, he could, he could jump and he could fly, right? When Forky realized that, oh, he had, he accepted that he had a greater purpose, you know, towards the end of the movie, when he um, joins the team and, and making the RV all crazy and, um, and, and going haywire and all that stuff. And he realized that like, he served a purpose. He was part of the team and he was able to give back, right? And then at the end, when he's able to, um, to help, you know, Bonnie get through kindergarten. And then because he went through all of that experience, right, just like peer support, because he went through all that experience, then when the new, um, I don't know what her name was, maybe Knifey um, at the end of the movie, but she was another toy that Bonnie had made. She was able to come in and he was able to help her realize and go through that process because he had already been through it, right? And so our pain can serve a purpose if we move into acceptance of it and then find that greater purpose and move into, into serving that greater purpose. And again, that can be scary, but it is so worth it. And I love what they said, be who you are right now, right? So that was that scene when they told Duke Kaboom, be who you are right now. And that's what I'm asking all of us to do. We need to stop comparing ourselves to what we think the standards are, those expectations like Duke Kaboom saw on TV. It's not even real right? If we're comparing ourselves to what we see on social media, this person is doing better. They're accomplishing more. They look better. They, they can sing, but whatever it is that you're comparing, we've got to stop and we've got to look inward and we've got to embrace ourselves and accept ourselves. Um, we've got to accept who we are right now and find those strengths, right? Flip that script, find those strengths. Um, that what, that what shame is telling us is the opposite of true. Okay. There is truth in the opposite of shame. And we've just got to find that message. 
And yes, it's scary. But as Woody said in the movie, if you sit on the shelf for the rest of your life, you'll never find out, right? You'll never find out how great it is to serve others. You'll never find that purpose outside of yourself. You'll never find that freedom, right? That freedom that I feel now from not having carrying that message around all the time anymore. And I'm, and I will, you know, be very transparent. It does pop back every once in a while, but now I recognize it, that it's shame. I, I know that, okay, what you're saying right now is not true. Okay. And I have those good friends now that I've leaned into that I haven't had those walls up anymore that I, I have those connections now because, and it was scary, but I overcame that because I knew that I had a greater purpose to serve for others as well. And so I don't want to sit on the shelf for the rest of my life. Um, I would love to know from your, in the comments, what do you think you could do? What do you, what do you think your purpose is outside of sitting on the shelf? What kind of purpose, what greater purpose do you want to serve? Or comment, what message do you want to tell shame? That's a good one. Um, and so the last step in making sure that we're able to overcome shame know that we're not our shame and live free from those negative messages inside of our heads, we've got to be able to meet our own needs. So shame comes a lot when we disregard ourselves, when we abandon ourselves, when we don't take care of ourselves. And that looks differently for everyone, right? Um, but there are some things in common. And so the number one thing that we can do to rid ourselves and free ourselves of those shame messages is to learn how to love ourselves. And I used to think this was ridiculous. Tell me to love myself. Tell me to give myself hugs, you know, write these messages, love letters to myself. And I just thought that was so silly. I did. Um, I had a lot of judgment about that. Right. But again, it was those shame messages that were coming through. I didn't realize we're back there. Um, and so I've gone on this journey to develop this intense relationship with myself. And this, this is what really helps to let me know that I'm worthy. Let me know that I'm not a piece of trash, that I do have value. You know, I, I needed that reflected from other people. I needed to know that, that because I saw that in other people, saw those strengths and those positive attributes that actually that showed up for me too. But ultimately I have to meet my own needs first before anybody else will be able to, right? Before I can be in true relationship with anybody else. And so the first thing that I can do is self-compassion. Okay, so that's empathy, right? We talked about empathy yesterday, but that's connecting to the emotional experience in others. I've got to have empathy for myself. And that's what will kill those internal shame messages. So self-compassion, mindfulness, paying attention to how I'm feeling, what I'm needing. Do I need more sleep? Do I need to get up and move more? Do I need more nutritious food, right? Um, some of those things are not, you know, not the same thing as self-indulgence, that self-care, making sure I'm taking care of myself, just like I would take care of a pet or a friend or um, a, a child. I've got to do that for myself as well. Um, nurture myself. So pay attention when I'm feeling sad, when I'm feeling down, am I stopping to actually listen to myself or am I just pushing through it, ignoring it, saying it doesn't matter, um, ignoring all of the emotions that I'm feeling or am I stopping to acknowledge, yeah, I feel sad right now. And just sitting in that for a minute and telling myself, it's okay that I feel sad. I'm not less than because I feel sad or down or upset or whatever, you know? Um, and really taking that time to nurture myself and give back to myself, tell myself those positive messages. Uh, inner child work is one that is a little bit more intensive. And um, I would actually recommend doing this work with a mental health professional if you have access to one. Um, but there are also some really great books that you can look into that can allow you to do this. This is another thing that a year ago I thought was absolutely ridiculous um, and realized that it was actually my shame stuff that was judging myself, that was making me feel embarrassed about doing any of this work. And I can tell you that this work uh, being able to meet the needs of my inner child that weren't met whenever I was a child. And now as an adult, I can meet those needs, um, has just been absolutely transformational. Um, there is a, a Instagram person called the holistic psychologist who I follow on Instagram. Um, 
she is incredible, incredible in what she posts and um, the messages and the work and being able to understand how important it is to understand that the needs that we got, that we didn't get met in childhood or the roles that we played in childhood play out now and what we need to do now to be able to heal ourselves. And a lot of that happens through that inner child work, that healing. Um, the other things that you can do that are really easy to help overcome those messages of shame, meditation, which really helps to practice that mindfulness. So if we completely ignore ourselves, um, we, we're not gonna be able to get in there and connect with ourselves and heal ourselves, right? So that mindfulness and that meditation can help us calm, can help us feel what's happening in our gut, can help with anxiety, right? So that's something I struggle with a lot, can help with depression, um, but really sitting with ourselves, even if it's just five minutes a day so that we can get to know ourselves and feel that in, in, in here. Um, journaling is another great way, whether that's through voice to text or writing or typing, um, whatever works for you. But journaling is something that helps all of those negative feelings, those negative emotions really get out of myself so that I can be free to serve a purpose for other people and for me. And that ability to rewrite our story. So once we know those negative shame messages, once we rewrite those into a positive one, um, you know, now I don't have to be a, a foster kid that falls into the same statistics of homelessness and, um, you know, jail or bad relationships or bad parenting where my kids go back into the system or whatever, or, or using substances my whole life, right? So I don't have to be that story. I get to rewrite that story. When I can break free from those shame messages and know that I'm worth more, I get to rewrite my story and say, I'm, I'm going to get my PhD. You know, I am a good mom. And those things, I'm a good friend, right? I can show up for my family. Um, those might seem like small things that some people take for granted, but that's not a given, especially for people that come from where I come from and have the messages of shame that I had. That's not a given that I'm going to be able to do all those things. Um, but now because I did the work on that, all the five steps that we just talked about, I'm able to rewrite my story and change how I show up. And then the last strategy is really staying true to you, listening to that gut and that intuition, right? To understand what is it that I really need? And am I listening to the positive messages about myself or am I believing the ones that don't serve me? So Woody and Buzz talked a couple of times about this, um, about listening to your inner voice. Like that's the way to find yourself through any situation that you're in. And at the end, uh, when they said Woody is a lost toy and Buzz said, he's not lost, right? Because he found himself, he found his purpose and he knew um, what purpose he was there to serve. So when we embrace ourselves, accept our true selves and listen to our inner voice to heal then we find that we belong in ourselves. When we heal from the inside, we can find our purpose and truly break free from shame. And so I hope that this has been helpful, understanding what shame is, understanding the messages that show up um, as shame and how that shows up in our lives and the impact that that has on keeping us small and limited and not in connection with ourselves and other people. Um, hopefully you've gotten something out of the five steps that you can take to be able to, uh, break free from shame, right? Name it, uh, recognize where it comes from, that it's not true, that you can separate yourself from it, that you can rewrite that story and replace it with a truer version of you and that you can meet your own needs, right? That you are empowered to do that. Um, then you can break free from shame. So I hope that was helpful. I do want to, we are at time, about time to ask questions if we had any. So thank you so much for showing up this weekend, for showing up for yourself, for the work that you have already been doing and that you'll continue to do to be a better version for yourself and for the people around you and for your larger purpose. And thank you so, so much. So do we have any questions? One of our viewers uh, sent in a question and asked, how has your experience of guilt and shame changed throughout your life? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I shared a little bit, but I think um, 
I did not know how much shame drove all of my behaviors. And I, over the years, you know, I really did some horrible things to myself um, because I, I was listening to that message of shame. And I think that really my relationship with shame has changed so much because it used to be this overpowering thing that drove everything, all of my beliefs. And now I know that it's, it's a liar and it can stay far away. And I recognize that I see that it's there. It may never go away, but I can put it in the place that it belongs, right? Way far over there, very small. And, um, and for guilt, you know, that's something that, that the best way out of guilt is accountability. And so making sure that I, I own any mistakes that I make, I apologize if I hurt people, um, I do whatever I need to to make it up, you know, with appropriate boundaries. And then I let it go. You know, then I have to let it go because I know that if I did everything I could, then it's out of my hands. And so um, there's a process for guilt too, which we didn't talk a lot about, but really that accountability and owning my part in things is really freeing as well. Well, we have another question from the audience. Uh, how, did, how did you stop worrying about how others uh, felt about, uh, thought about you and uh, how did you respond to your feelings, thoughts, and desires? Oh, that's a good one. That takes practice every day. Um, I still struggle with that sometimes. I still take things personally. Like even today, I am still like, oh my gosh, I hope people like this message. I hope that they get something out of it. But then my thought process, instead of going into fear of, oh my gosh, what if they didn't like it? I go into the positive affirmations that I know I did my best. I know I gave a message that helped me. And so I know that even if one person gets something out of it, then it's helpful. And so I really have to pay attention to that loving myself and treating myself like I would my best friend, right? So that's how I kind of separate taking out, taking it personally um, and, and what others think about me into what do I think about me? Because that's the most important thing. Am I showing up in my values and how I think I need to show up? And am I being a good person by my own definition? And that ultimately is the most important thing because those other people don't have to live with you every day. You're the one that has to live with you every day. And so it really just meant changing the way that we define how, um, you know, how we're measuring ourselves by our own standards is so important. We got another question. How do you stop yourself from shutting out the world while feeling ashamed of yourself? Oh, okay. So, so when we're in shame, like when we are in knee deep in shame, um, it's, it's really hard not to shut everybody out. Um, but when we have that group, so if you have a, a small handful of group of people that you trust that can show you empathy when you're in shame, um, that's how we get out of it, right? So even if it's, if it's ourselves sometimes, so I kind of train myself and it takes practice and it takes time. But when I start feeling those shame storms come on, I can name it, right? So, oh, oh, okay, I'm saying all this negative stuff about myself. I'm feeling it in my gut. Like I tend to, if I'm in a shame storm, like fall on the ground and just feel like worthless. And now that I've gone through it enough, I can recognize, oh, I'm in a shame storm. Okay, so what can I do to get out of that? Well, empathy kills shame, naming it kills shame. And so I have a few, like three really good friends that I can call and say, I'm feeling really bad about myself. I need, and, and they can be empathetic and they can give me some of that empathy that kills shame. Or I can say, I know that I'm not this bad person, right? I know that I'm not this bad person until I get out of it enough that I can take these steps that I just talked about. I hope that helps. Yeah, we have another question. Uh, yeah. Lacey, I, I know you mentioned about how, you know, social media kind of plays an effect in the person's mentally. And sometimes we kind of uh, like we we have some sort of uh, dopamine tolerance, like in our brain, we have the chemical of dopamine that we something that we want to desire for that was somebody else has. It could be having a nice car or, you know, having a great relationship. And then when they feel like they don't have those things, then that's when they kind of start, you know, questioning themselves, questioning their existence. And I know throughout the sessions we had you know, those type of conversations where, you know, people would not feel like they had no val validation. And yeah. my question to you is, why do you think people, especially like people who are on social media or, um, or really anything, 
but mostly social media, I would probably say, why do you think people seek validation from others that they haven't met? Like mm-hmm. if like attracts like, and they wanted to have, you know, that type of inner circle and, and, and wanted to, you know, uh, have that, uh, well, pretty much like, let's put, let's put it this way. If you have an Instagram account, you have like so many followers, like that kind of, it kind of builds up someone's self-esteem because, you know, they already are getting popular. They're already, you know, having that, uh, broad outside, uh, attraction. But why do you think people seek validation from like other people just to make them feel good about themselves instead of just, instead of having other people trying to make them feel good? Why did, why they don't have those people feel themselves like, you know, they can actually feel like they have value on themselves instead of just having some strangers, you know, telling them they have validation. Yeah, that's a really, really great, powerful and important question. Um, So for me, what I've had to realize, because I used to be really bad about that, like this person got this award and I would feel like horrible for three months or, you know, this person got this new house or this person looks like this or, you know, and what I really had to learn is that so one recognize that those are messages that are from society, right, but they're also messages that we take on, we can choose like they're putting those out. We can choose whether we want to pick those up and put those on ourselves or not. And so what I've had to learn is that I, I get to decide what messages come in. Does this message, like, does it help me? Does it make me feel better to look at these accounts on social media or not? Right. And so if I'm feeling worse, then I need to stop doing the things that make me feel worse. Right. Um, the, the thing I keep saying to myself, if I'm feeling less than, you know, comparing myself to others is I am okay right now. I am okay right now and gratitude. Like I'm grateful that I have a house. I'm grateful that I have a job. I'm grateful that I have friends. I am okay right now. Like I really have to, to repeat that to myself. Sometimes it's all day that I have to repeat that to myself, but what I've done is to really change um, what I see on my newsfeed. Like I do not look at Facebook anymore. You'll see me post on it, but I actually don't really interact that much. Um, It has not been a very source of, um, a source of very positive stuff. So I just don't look at it anymore. Um, but on, on Instagram, I have changed my news feed to where I only follow accounts that make me feel better. I only follow accounts that make me feel good and give me strategies and inspiration um, and people that I genuinely care about. And so I really limit and have boundaries um, on social media because I know that I am prone to that as well. And you talk about why we do that. I don't, I don't know that I have like a a really in-depth answer about why we as people do that. Um, I think a lot of it is our specific society is really competitive. And so if you're not competing at the same level as everybody else by winning the cars, winning the jobs, winning the, you know, whatever. um, I just, I think that that is a message that we have to be very aware and very careful about what we're listening to and paying attention to. If it's not making you feel better, stop doing it. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, okay, awesome. yeah, for the most part. But um, it looks like we don't have any uh, questions. Um, but if anybody that's uh, watching the live stream, you can comment any new questions. So maybe Lacey can, you know, answer them uh, on, on the comment section down below. Um, is there anything uh, you want to close out, Lacey? Yeah, I think just the main message, the best way um, to know that we're not our shame is to love yourself and embrace yourself exactly as who you are right now. It does not matter if you have full ability of all of your arms and legs. It doesn't matter if you have full capacity of your head all the time. It doesn't matter how you're performing compared to others. What matters is that you have value regardless. It does not matter what box society puts you in you have value and you have strengths that you can give and you have a purpose, you have a a bigger purpose. And so if you're feeling really down, if you're feeling in that shame, reach out, um, find other people who make you feel better, who can give you that empathy, Um, rewrite your story. Don't settle for shame anymore. Don't settle for those messages that shame is giving you. You know, you, you have value, you do, and you have a bigger purpose and you don't have to stay stuck anymore. So, um, so that's, I think that's the message that I want to leave. Just love yourself and embrace yourself for where you are right now. And, um, yeah, it's a journey, but you can absolutely do it. Yeah. Very well said. Thank you. Um, 
At, uh, and as this our final session comes to an end, we just want to remind you to, um, to please check out the re uh, report card link that we've linked in the comments so we can get some feedback on everything. And uh, as we leave you, we just want to, uh, we'd like to give a shout out to uh, the people behind the scenes, the cafe staff um, that helped us put this on, yeah. uh, Michael for directing over here behind the camera. <laughs> and, um, and everybody involved here, you know, want to thank Nikki. We want to thank yeah, all the guest uh, speakers that came along to do the sessions. And we also want to thank Judy for, you know, doing all the, uh, the sign language. And uh, anybody who had been working, you know, behind the scenes, you know, here, we all appreciate you guys being here. And thank you to all of you who has actually been watching, you know, throughout this entire weekend. You know, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate Definitely. all the support that you guys have been given to Family Cafe and the Florida Youth Council. We hope you guys get a chance to see, you know, everyone face to face next year. We're hoping, we're hoping if, you know, once the, we can go back to normal and all the pandemic is, um, is done. But for you, for guys watching, for guys being here, we still appreciate you guys and we want to thank you. So, and, and until we see you again, uh, we definitely invite you to uh, a quick plug. Please, please like our, uh, Florida Youth Council Facebook page. Uh, we put our monthly uh, newsletter up every month. We post vlogs that our council members do. Um, and definitely uh, keep up with us on that, please. And don't forget, we um, our vlogs are on our YouTube page. So make sure you go subscribe and make sure you like our videos. Uh, we do post vlogs on our YouTube page and we do have a Twitter. So make sure you go follow us on Twitter. And if you're interested in wanting to join the Florida Youth Council, make sure you go on our website and you register. So that way you can fax it to the Family Cafe office. So with that, with that being said, um, we you. appreciate thank all, you. Yeah, we appreciate everybody being here. Uh, thank you for all you guys have done. And thank you to everybody here. I'm Alex, this is Derek. And hopefully we guys get to see you next, next year. Time on the 14th annual uh, annual use summit. So thank you guys. You guys have a great day.